We're in James chapter 1 still, and uh, we'll be for a few more weeks here. But uh, uh, we've been looking uh, at initially the idea that uh, James is saying that we can have joy uh, even in the midst of trials. Trial, there's nothing joyful uh, about a trial, uh, but in the midst of a trial, uh, we can have joy. Uh, we also can pray for wisdom. That was our next little section there. Uh, that in the midst of a trial, we should pray for wisdom. And if we do that without doubting, without being a double-faced uh, person, is the way that he uh, describes it there, uh, God will give us wisdom in the midst of, of our trials. Uh, and then last time we looked at uh, finances. Certainly finances can be a trial as well. Uh, but here he addresses specifically uh, the blessing it is spiritually to be poor. He talked about, again, the, the, how rich... The poor are, and yet how poor the rich are spiritually, and the difficulty uh, and, uh, if, uh, for that wealthy person, even as Jesus described, uh, and we alluded to the rich young ruler that came to him, uh, whose riches meant more to him than salvation, uh, and he went away very sad. So we looked at that uh, last time. Uh, this time we're at the, uh, the problem of temptation in verses 12 to 13, uh, and um, it's very, very interesting the way that he, he breaks this down to help us understand. And uh, I know that many, most of you here have never been tempted to sin, but you might meet someone day, that is. So this could be helpful that you can share with them. Uh, it's, a, it's a very interesting uh, process. Uh, is that the same thing as God testing us? No, it's two different things. And he'll make that distinction uh, very, very clear as well. Uh, later in James, in James 4, 17, he says, If anyone then... Who knows the good that he ought to do and doesn't do it since. So there's not just sins of commission, there's the sins of omission. I like what one uh, kid in Sunday school said as his teacher tried to explain that. Uh, she asked him, what, what is a sin of omission? And he said, omission. Uh, those are the sins you should have committed, but you didn't get around to it. <laughs> well, that's not quite exactly what we're talking about, but... Uh, there's a role that temptation plays, and James will lay it out in terms of how it actually uh, works. Again, uh, if we're not careful in a time of a trial or a testing, Satan will come in and bring temptation. They're really uh, two, two different things. When our circumstances are difficult, we might find ourselves being tempted to complain against God, to question his love, to resist his will, uh, and, uh, and that's the concern. Well, let's look at verses 12 to 15. We'll read it and kind of go back and, uh, and break it down. Uh, verse 12. Blessed is the man who endures temptation. For when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. So the first thing we note in verse 12 is that those who persevere uh, will be blessed. Blessed is the man who endures temptation. So uh, again, the overall theme of the book, we could say it is a question, uh, what is a genuine uh, Christian? Uh, or this idea that uh, that faith works. There's evidence in our lives if we're truly believers. And that's part of what uh, is being expressed here in verse 12. Uh, when we persevere, we will be blessed. It's the same term that's used on the Sermon on the, on the Mount. Uh, blessed are the poor in spirit, for they shall inherit the kingdom of God. Uh, it's that internal satisfaction or joy that we can have in our hearts, even in the midst of a, of a trial. And when we endure it, uh, in that way, we're, we're blessed. Uh, uh, to endure means to bear up under. It was a term that was used in the ancient world when a person would go down to a, a water source, like a river or stream, to get water. They would, put, uh, uh, they would fill their two buckets, put a stick in between, and put it on their shoulder to carry it back. When they put it on their shoulder, they were enduring. They were bearing up. Uh, that's the idea. Uh, even in the midst of being tempted, we literally can bear up under it. Uh, and when approved, which is the term that uh, is used of metals being tested, uh, we will receive a, a crown of life. Very interesting. 
uh, this idea of the crown of life is, uh, uh, is one, of course, that we're familiar with. It's the Greek term Stephanos, so it's not diadem like a kingly crown. Uh, it's uh, like the type that would be given uh, in the Greek or later the Olympic Games uh, as a reward. Uh, and because of that, I think when we first read this, we kind of associate this with then there's five crowns that are mentioned in the New Testament that will be given like to a martyr and so forth. Uh, crowns or rewards presented uh, at the judgment seat of, of Christ. I think this is a little different here, and I want to give you a couple of reasons for it, because every time we hit that word, crown, of, uh, some kind of a crown, Stephanos, like in the Olympic Games, we kind of associate it with, uh, with something in terms of uh, a special reward at the end of life. But uh, again, going back to our main theme of, of what is a genuine Christian, I think we're seeing here a genuine Christian is someone who endures temptation. A genuine Christian is not someone who, every time they're tempted, they just fall into sin. That, that's, that's, not a, that's not a Christian, uh, I think, is the idea here. Let me get, I'm going to give you a couple of uh, references here to kind of help us. One is uh, 1 Peter 1.6. Uh, Peter uh, writing on a very uh, similar subject matter, discussing trials. Uh, make a, a very similar reference to this eye being tested uh, like metals are tested, uh, our word for endure, uh, for approved here. Uh, verse 6, Peter says, uh, In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, uh, you have been grieved by various trials. Uh, here's the reason, that the genuineness of your faith, which is James's concern as well, being much more precious than gold that perishes, Though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen, you love. Though now you do not see him, yet believing, you rejoice with unexpressible joy unexpressible and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, not a reward at the end, but actually the salvation of your souls." So in Peter's case, very similar language, subject matter. Uh, he's not discussing a reward like the uh, other five crowns. He's actually talking about salvation uh, itself. Now again, uh, in our passage in James, it's a believer who endures that receives the, the crown of life. Therefore, non-believers do not endure and do not receive uh, a crown of life. Uh, let's look at one more passage where the term is actually used, crown of life. And it's over in Revelation 2.10. John writing, or same, uh, uh, excuse me, a different author, but uh, same subject matter. Uh, he says there in Revelation 2.10, Do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested. Uh, and you will have tribulation ten days. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says of the churches. He who overcomes shall be hurt, not hurt, by the second death. Here's the crown of life as mentioned, uh, tribulation for a period of ten days. Most writers believe that it's a reference to ten time periods, and there were ten great persecutions within the Roman Empire. Uh, that's probably what uh, is in view here. Uh, the idea, be, be faithful uh, unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. Uh, who does it go to? Those that overcome. Uh, in all of these seven letters to the seven churches that are all ended in the same way, the overcomers are, are the believers. Uh, the believers are given a crown of life. I think the crown of life is really just a, a, a picture or the issue of, of salvation. Uh, I, again, the, uh, when we endure a time of temptation, uh, it indicates that we're actually believers. Non-believers don't endure. <laughs> they just fall into sin uh, repeatedly and over and over again. This is not talking about perfection. Uh, again, uh, John would say, if you sit to believers, if you say you have no sin, you deceive yourself and the truth is not in you. Uh, it's, not a, it's not a matter of perfection. But uh, again, as believers, James is saying, I believe, if you're a genuine believer in Jesus Christ, if God's spirit is uh, resident uh, in you, uh, you will be able to endure times of temptation. I think that's good news. Uh, I'm, I'm pretty thankful for that. Uh, does that mean uh, we'll, every time we'll endure it? No. Uh, but it means generally in our life, there should be a pattern where we're able to endure temptation and not fall into sin. 
And uh, we said often that, um, that again, we're, it doesn't mean that we're sinless, but it should mean that we're sinning less <laughs> and less and less as we uh, mature uh, in Jesus Christ. But those who persevere uh, under a time of, uh, of temptation are, are going to be blessed. Uh, and they're going to, uh, it's an indication uh, of their actual salvation. The second thing we learn about temptation is this, and again, more of the dynamics here uh, in this statement about God. Uh, no one can pass the blame onto God. That's in verse 13. Let no one say when he's tempted, I'm tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. So uh, no one can blame God, James says, because it's not rational. Uh, and he kind of, because that's our, our tendency is to uh, basically, we can rationalize about anything. And one of the ways that we rationalize our falling into sin is to actually blame uh, God for it. Uh, James says it's not logical because it's not in the nature of God. God cannot be tempted by evil, therefore he can't tempt anyone else. He uses a rare verbal adjective here that means that God is unable to be tempted. He's untemptable. One writer says, uh, the sense is that God is unsusceptible to evil. Evil has never had any appeal to him. Uh, evil cannot promote even the slightest appealing tug of the heart of God. Uh, there's no evil in him. He's never tempted by it. It doesn't come into the thought of his mind. It has no appeal at, at all. Therefore, James says, how can he tempt someone else with evil? Something, a thought that he's never entertained himself. Uh, and so he tries to erase this idea, uh, which is the tendency sometimes, and we'll, we'll give you a couple examples in a moment, uh, of this idea that when we're tempted, we should be able to endure. Uh, and when we do, it's an indication of our, uh, our own salvation. Uh, but at the same time, uh, if, we, if we are unable and we fall into sin through a temptation, uh, we should never blame God. Well, it's God's fault, uh, after all. Uh, James says it's not, that's not logical. It's not, uh, not reasonable. And because of that, then he says no one can pass the blame onto God, even though it might relieve our guilt, because that's really the, the issue. Uh, he uh, why does James bring this up in dealing with sin? Because it's, uh, it's a very common thing. Uh, Adam blamed God for his sin uh, in the Garden of Eden. that has been going on ever since. Uh, Will Rogers once said the pa uh, that uh, there's two eras uh, in American history. The passing of the buffalo and the passing of the buck. Uh, because, uh, and, uh, and of course, uh, Will Rogers, some of you are going, Who, who's that? Well, that was a guy who lived a long time ago. But... Uh, uh, things haven't changed much. It's a very, very common in our, in our culture is that uh, it is always someone else's fault. Uh, and if you don't have anyone to blame, you can go to a professional that will help you find someone to blame. They are called a psychologist. <laughs> they, will, they will help you find someone that you can blame uh, rather than uh, accept responsibility for, for yourself. I talked to someone not that long ago. He was talking about the fact that, that uh, of Judas and his betrayal of Jesus uh, really had no choice in terms of his sin sinful behavior. After God, all, God had preordained that someone would betray the Messiah, uh, so he was just fulfilling his own role. It wasn't really his fault. Uh, again, some sin and blame God because of circumstances. Well, you know, I had to cheat on the test because, after all, I got a lousy professor, and I'm I'm not too smart myself. Uh, that could be a direct quote. I'm not sure if I, uh, that was from my memory banks or a conversation with someone else. But uh, uh, we're always, uh, you know, it's, it, it's God's fault. Uh, if, uh, if God didn't want me to li live such a lustful lifestyle, he would not have given me the, these desires. Uh, there's just, there's a lot of blaming going on out there. James says it's not logical. It's not reason. It might help you with your guilt, but it's not the truth. Thirdly, he says, <clears throat> or we would say, no one can pass the blame on to God, even though he does test us. Uh, and, of course, uh, we make uh, the distinction. Uh, a couple of, couple of classic examples. The Bible is full of them. Uh, Abraham arrives in Canaan. Uh, he's only there a short period of time. It's taken him a while to get there, of course. If, uh, God calls him out of Ur the Chaldeum, <clears throat> tells him to, to leave and go to the city and the place he's going to uh, direct him to. Uh, tells him to <coughs> leave his family, 
which uh, he doesn't do. He brings most of them with him, uh, tells them that he doesn't quite make it all the way to where God is directing him. He only moves up to Haran, uh, slightly up the river, a little farther, and he's there till his father dies. Uh, finally, he follows God again and gets to Canaan. Uh, he's in the land of Canaan. God uh, promises it all to him. Uh, the first time there's a drought, oh, there's a time of testing now. There's not enough water. What will Abraham do? Will he endure the temptation? No, he doesn't. He leaves and he goes to, goes to Egypt. And, of course, there's some repercussions uh, of that visit uh, for many years that play out in the, in the life of his nephew uh, named Lot. Uh, but again, uh, there was a time of testing. Uh, God is about ready to show Abraham his faithfulness to him, even in a time of drought. He's going to provide for him, but he's not able to endure uh, and he, the temptation to go somewhere else where there was food and water and so forth. Uh, and so he fails uh, in, uh, in terms of being uh, tempted and drawn away. Uh, Israel in the wilderness wandering. <clears throat> the nation is tested many times. Uh, no sooner have they been delivered out of Egypt, their water supply vanishes. They go three days and three nights without water in the desert. Uh, and uh, they begin to grumble and complain against God, even though he'd done so many miraculous things that they had experienced. Uh, so again, a time of testing. Oh, there's no water for three days. Uh, will they continue to trust God or not? Uh, Satan comes in and tempts them to grumble and complain against God, which they do. So again, there is a time of testing. Uh, in the time of testing, often that's when Satan will come in and bring a temptation. But these two things are very different. If we persevere under them, uh, it's an indication of our own salvation. Uh, but there, uh, there's an opportunity, or at least uh, uh, we'd see it some advantage to relieve our guilt when we fall into sin by blaming God. Uh, and James says it's not logical uh, and it's not reasonable. Let's get on to uh, the third thing about temptation, the problem. And here's the problem. It's our own desires. Verse 14. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires uh, and enticed. And this is a very... Uh, loaded verse in terms of, in terms of meaning, but uh, let's look at the root problem of our own desires. Uh, the problem is we want to blame, as we said, other things in other people. Uh, and I, I want to mention uh, five of them, that, that I, and I just to give credit where credit's due <coughs> to David Hawking. <coughs> I was uh, going through one of his uh, messages and came across these, and, and uh, I, want to, I want to mention these and mention them in their proper context. Uh, because it, even though we're saying, and we'll go on and talk about this, the problem is us. The problem is our own desires. We have natural desires. Uh, we have a natural desire to eat. That's okay, right? Gluttony isn't. Uh, yeah, 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 we'll, we'll talk about that more uh, as we get to it. But there's a, there's a desire. It might be a natural desire. It's okay. Satan will come in and tempt us to sin uh, using our own desires. Uh, the problem is us, and we need to own up to it and see our own responsibility in sin uh, and uh, in the temptation and how it works and the mechanics of it. We understand that it might help us endure and not fall to it. Uh, to say that, it doesn't mean that there aren't other factors. Uh, and so I want to tell you what some other problems that are really not the problem. One of the problems that is really not the problem is we often blame the scenery or our environment, or it's a workplace, uh, or it's the way uh, uh, women happen to dress at the beach uh, in, in Hawaii, whatever it might be. It's the scenery. Uh, that's why I fall into sin. No, it's, it's your own desires. That, that's the problem. Does it play a factor? Yeah, it absolutely plays a factor. Uh, over in Second Peter, again, we have the example of, uh, of Lot in Second uh, Peter 2, 7, talking about... Uh, uh, the Lord able to deliver and what was going on in the side of Gomorrah. And it just says there, and delivered righteous Lot, who was oppressed by the filthy conduct of the wicked, for that righteous man dwelling among them tormented his righteous soul from day to day by seeing and hearing their lawless deeds. Uh, was the environment, the scenery in Sodom and Gomorrah good for Lot or bad? It was bad. Uh, it made it more difficult. Uh, again, 
Uh, we, when we fall into sin, the problem is us and our own desires. Are there things that make it more difficult? Yes, yes, there are. The scenery is not the problem, but it's a problem. Uh, secondly, we often blame society. We see it's other people. Uh, James in James chapter uh, 4 verse 1 mentions the idea of the friendship of the world. And he could be talking about the philosophies of this world, but he's also often talking about people of the world. Uh, in 1 Corinthians 15.33, a, a good parental verse here, uh, do not be deceived, evil company corrupts good habits, or uh, bad company corrupts good morals. Uh, are other people uh, a bad influence? Can they be a bad influence on you and your behavior and falling into sin? Yes, they can. Are they the problem? No, they're not the problem. They're a problem, but they're not the problem. The problem is our own desires. We can often blame Satan. We certainly see this again in Genesis 3 and chapter 1. It says, Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, His God indeed said, You shall not eat of any tree of, of the garden. Again, uh, the devil is there. He's bringing a, a, a temptation. Uh, we can blame things on the devil. Should we be concerned? Yeah, Paul in Ephesians 6 says, you better put on the full armor of God so that you're able to stand in the day when Satan comes, and that day of temptation comes. Uh, is Satan the problem? He's not the problem, but he's a problem, isn't he? And the scripture has a lot to say about him. Uh, we often blame, number four, our spouse. <laughs> no, no, no amens. Please keep, keep quiet. Uh, don't get yourself in trouble here. It's our sin nature to blame others. But one of the ways that we are able to control our sexual appetites is by marriage. And Paul lays it out very clearly in 1 Corinthians 7, uh, 1, 1 to 5. Uh, the wife's body is not her own. It belongs to the husband. The husband's body is not his. It belongs to the wife. Uh, he, he gives one small condition <laughs> for withholding yourselves for one another. Uh, is, uh, is our spouse the problem? No, no, no comments. Is, there pro is that the problem? Uh, it could be a problem, but it's not the problem. The problem is our, our own desires. We often blame, blame the Savior. Now, we've kind of mentioned this already. We can't blame God, James says, but sometimes we do. The Lord caused it. The Lord could have stopped me. The Lord could have not had me in that place at, uh, at that time. Uh, again, the classic uh, is, uh, is Genesis 3.12. This is Adam. Uh, after the sin, after the fall, then the man said, the woman whom you gave uh, to me, uh, gave to be with me, she gave me of the tree and I ate. In other words, uh, Adam is saying, it's really your fault, God. I mean, you could have created any woman. You had to create this one that would fall into sin and then tempt me. This is really all on you. There's a temptation to blame the Savior and blame God when we fall into sin. Uh, again, the problem is our own desires. So let's look at that word, the problem, our own, uh, own desire. Secondly, uh, it's, uh, again, as I mentioned, a normal desire. Again, we might feel hunger and thirst, uh, and that's a good thing, so that we'll eat and we'll drink. Uh, without fatigue, our bodies would never take, take a rest. Without a normal sexual desire, the human race would not uh, continue. Uh, and it's, it's okay if we satisfy these desires in the context of, of God's will. As I mentioned, eating is normal, gluttony is not. Sleep is normal, laziness uh, is not. Sexual fulfillment in, the, in a normal context of marriage is fine outside of God's will. It's not. It's a natural. How, how does temptation work? Uh, the, James is kind of giving us the mechanics uh, if we take it apart. He will come and make an appeal to our desires, our natural desires, and that's the problem. That's where he comes in to bring the temptation. Uh, and, uh, and he's going to be able to lure us away, which is our, our next point. There's a process uh, that actually goes on. Let me read verse 14 and 15 with it. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own evil desires. Very key word there, drawn away. Uh, and then, uh, and enticed, another very key word. Then when sin uh, has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it's full grown, uh, brings forth death. So the process involves uh, deception. 
uh, no temptation appears as temptation. <laughs> it always seems uh, like a different reality. He uses two <laughs> illustrations, one of the world of sports uh, to prove his point, uh, and that's our word drawn away. Drawn away carries the idea of, uh, of baiting a trap, uh, enticed uh, in the original Greek means to bait a hook. Uh, and here the idea of the, the fisherman and the hunter. And uh, don't do a lot of hunting, but uh, do a little bit of fishing. And I can tell you, when we put bait on a hook, we're hoping the fish doesn't realize it's a hook. <laughs> we're hoping he looks at it and it just looks like a good meal to him. Uh, we're not putting it on there in such a way is that he realizes uh, that, uh, wow, this would be really bad if I chomp down into that. We actually want it to be the opposite. Uh, we want it to, if it's a lure, to look and act like a fish. Uh, and the, the best bait, of course, is if you can get a live fish uh, and, uh, and hook it on there that's still, still moving. Uh, you're probably going to get a hit there, whether you bring the fish in or not. Uh, is uh, going to be dependent upon your, your skill and so forth. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, that's the way temptation is. That's the description. Uh, we're hoping the lure will bring the fish out from underneath the rocks where they happen to be hiding. Uh, there'll be something of appeal. Uh, they'll leave the safety of those rocks, which would cut the fishing line. We want them to come out of a place of safety because they're alert. They can't realize that they're being tempted. It just has to look like a meal to them and something inviting to them or appealing to a natural desire, food uh, to eat something they do on a regular basis. We get them out of their safety and out there, and by the time they chomp on it, uh, the hook is in their mouth. It was never intended by their point. We deceive them. We trick them. That's the idea of temptation. Uh, when you're facing temptation, many times, most times, the tendency is it will draw you out of a place of safety in Jesus Christ, uh, in the Word, in fellowship with other believers, it will make you think your circumstances are very special uh, and you're drawn out into it, out of that place of safety. It doesn't look like a temptation. And because it doesn't look like a temptation, there is no consideration of the consequences. There's no consideration of the consequences. Uh, if uh, Satan is really doing his thing well, uh, he will cloud your mind and thoughts so that you do not see uh, the consequences. Uh, if we put the, the hook and the bait in the water, uh, and the hook is exposed, the fish sees it and thinks, if I bite that, I'm somebody's dinner tonight. No thank you. So we can't do it that way. That's the way Satan does it as well. Uh, we're drawn away. We are enticed uh, to a natural desire we don't realize or consider the consequences of our actions. And there's a classic example of that, uh, again, uh, in, uh, in Proverbs that I've mentioned it before, and we won't go through the entire Proverbs, but it's, uh, it's a young guy, and he's being lured away. Uh, and he's, uh, my point is here, he's not going to consider the consequences. Uh, it begins in Proverbs 7, 7, and I saw that among the simple I perceived among the youths, a young man devoid of understanding, passing along the street near her corner, and he took the path to her house in the twilight, in the evening, in the black and dark night, and there a, a woman met him with the attire of a harlot and a crafty heart. Now we point out that he's in the wrong place at the wrong time, at night, uh, and where he shouldn't be to start with. Uh, and it goes on, of course, in the enticing language uh, that she says. But I want to get down to verse 18 uh, to make my point. She says, come, let us uh, take our fill of love until morning. Let us delight ourselves with love. For my husband is not at home. He's gone on a long journey. He's taken a bag of money with him. And he will come home on the point of day. We'll never be caught. There are no consequences, she's saying. That's key. If you, if you see the consequences, you don't fall into temptation. You know, if, you, uh, uh, if you're tempted to cheat on your taxes, I don't care, whatever it is, if you understand there are consequences to your actions, you won't fall into temptation. How do we endure under temptation? Realize there are consequences. See the consequences. Realize that this is a temptation. This is, uh, this is a natural desire, but this is going outside the context of, uh, of God's will. 
Uh, again, it's an insightful picture of how sin actually operates. Uh, and I can tell you, there's a lot of times, more than not when I'm fishing, I get a lot of bites and no fish. <laughs> I can tell they're nibbling. I, I can tell they're even taking the bait. Uh, but none of them are getting hooked. Uh, why? They're not deceived at all. They realize the consequences. They come up, they take a bite, they sense the hook, they spit it right out. That's what we're supposed to be doing. Uh, realize what's going on when the temptation comes and we spit the hook right, right out of our mouth uh, in order to, uh, in, at least in this metaphor or illustration. Now, I want to make reference to a, a fellow now and just to give a quote from him that used to work to focus on the family <coughs> and uh, this was a number of years ago and uh, he was uh, he was actually the uh, one of the hosts with Dr. Dobson he was the guy that came on and you know welcome to focus on the family and this is you know gave his name and so forth and so he's uh, he's he's speaking to you know uh, thousands of people uh, on the radio every day on behalf of the family and uh, marriage and so forth uh, and in the midst of, of his job, uh, it was discovered and then uh, reported in the Colorado Springs Gazette that he was having a, quote, extramarital emotional uh, relationship. Uh, he uh, said he'd been engaged for uh, in an inappropriate relationship with a woman other than my wife. Uh, but, he, but here's the thing. Uh, uh, he said, when asked during an hour-long interview why he got involved with the other woman, he said, I wish I knew. He had no idea. He had no idea how it all started. He never saw it coming. That's the whole point. That's what temptation is. Uh, successful temptation. Why we fall. We don't see it coming. It's just, it's just a nice fish uh, out there in front of me, and it's, uh, it's, it's lunch. It's dinner. This is like a handout. I don't even hardly have to chase it down. It's kind of waving its uh, right in front of me. Uh, there's no sense of the consequences or what's really going on. Uh, he says, I wish I knew. And I, I can just tell you, there's a lot of people that would uh, say very, very similar uh, when they kind of, and we, we talk about that, that uh, when we'll, we'll hear about somebody that's fallen into some kind of sin, especially sexual sin, we all say, well, the light will come on. It'll come on. You'll wake up one morning and go, oh my gosh, what in the world have I done? It, it'll happen. It'll happen sooner or later. Maybe it's a week, maybe it's six months, or it might be a year. Sooner or later, all of a sudden, the illusion uh, will all be gone. Uh, in his book, Temptation, Dietrich Bonhoeffer offers the, uh, uh, the following uh, uh, in terms of a quote. I, I think it's very interesting. He says, when uh, irresistible power uh, uh, desire seizes mastery over the flesh, uh, it makes no difference whether it's uh, sexual desire or ambition, vanity, <coughs> desire for revenge, uh, love of fame and power or greed or money for money. Joy in God is extinguished in us and we seek all our joy in the creature. At this moment, God is quite unreal to us. He loses all reality and only desire for the creature is real. Satan does not here fill us with hatred for God, but with forgetfulness of God. The lust thus aroused envelops the mind and will of man in deepest darkness. The powers of clear discrimination and of decision are taken from us. The question presents themselves, is what the flesh desires really sin in this case? Uh, is it really not permitted to me, yes, expected of me now, here, in my particular situation, to appease desire. It is here that everything within me rises up against the word of God. It's not that Satan gets us to hate God. We just forget God. We forget the word of God. We forget everything. It's a, it's a deception. That's what temptation is. I think uh, very insightful what James has to say and the kind of language that he's using here. And then he goes on. The product of sin. What does it produce? In the second half of verse 15. And sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. So it produces death. The product of sin always will be death. Disobedience gives birth to death and not life. It might take years for sin to mature. But when it does, it will always produce uh, the same thing. Uh, again, there's, uh, uh, he, he's describing sin running its full course. 
Because the idea that is that we can be tempted and fall into a sin. And it could be a period of time before it actually produces anything. Uh, and uh, it will always produce death. Uh, there are two verses uh, in view. First, evil desire is what gives birth to sin. That's what we've already talked about. Secondly, then sin gives birth to death. The second birth in the course of temptation uh, in sin, when it's full grown, is uh, again particularly chilling. Uh, the idea is that sin grows rapidly. It's like an embryo that grows to maturity. Uh, but when it's full state, the pregnancy must end. That's the idea of the language. I and mean, what comes forth uh, every time will be death. Uh, again, the point is, uh, the only thing that sin will ever produce is death. It will never conceive and bring forth life. James' main point is, uh, we can never say any of the following. God made me do it. My friends made me do it. The circumstances made me do it. The devil made me do it. We're all responsible for our own sin. Are those things, those five things, problems? They're they absolutely problems. Uh, but the main problem is me. And I can't blame the other things, and I can't blame, blame God. Uh, it's the desire within me. We live in a fallen world. It's full of evil. Satan is alive. He can bring temptation. He can lure us. James says, though, that if you're a true believer in Jesus Christ, you've been saved by the blood of Jesus Christ, you'll be able to endure. Under. You'll bear up under the temptation. And it'll be an indication of your own salvation. <clears throat> every time? No, not every time. We're not talking about perfection. <clears throat> but if you fall into sin every time, every time you're tempted, you fall into sin, I like to suggest you're not really saved. <laughs> that's, that's kind of an impossibility here. Uh, you've got God's Spirit in you. Jesus Christ died for our sins. The penalty of sin and the power of sin over our lives. Sometimes as believers, we, we grasp the one and we're thankful for eternal life. We don't even grasp the other one. <clears throat> Just because I always did this before, said this before, always had this anger before, always, it, it doesn't have to continue. It doesn't have to continue. Jesus Christ died so that those things, especially those habitual things, can be, uh, can be broken. That's a wonderful thing if you're addicted to drugs like I was. To see that's broken. I don't have to go on anymore because Jesus Christ has come. I can endure a temptation I could never endure before. And when I see that happen, I think, oh my goodness, I'm really saved. That never happened before. And we need to see it. We need to understand the temptation. Again, we're not talking about perfection, but sin separates us from God. <clears throat> it will always bring God death to us. There's a cycle that can be broken. Jesus is the source of victory of sin uh, and temptation. That is the glory of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It changes people's lives. It transforms us. We don't have to continue to fall in those habitual sins uh, any longer. Again, how do we deal with the desire within us and I just want to leave you with a couple of things, and it's not rocket science. It's not like we haven't mentioned these things before. Uh, the resources we have is, is prayer. Prayer is a resource. Uh, Matthew uh, 20, 26, 40. Uh, then he came to the disciples, who's in the Garden of Gethsemane, found them sleeping, and said to Peter, Why could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray. Why? Lest you enter into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. When it says the flesh is weak, it means it's worth nothing. <laughs> On your own physically, you're not going to be able to endure under a time of, of temptation. Uh, but if you'll watch and pray, it will make all the difference in the world. Uh, you sense that this is a temptation. This could be wrong. It might be wrong. You're considering. You're beginning to think about it. The lure is beginning to be more alluring to you. <clears throat> well, you better start praying uh, is, uh, is the idea. And we can start praying. Secondly, the Bible is a resource. <clears throat> kind of the classics, uh, Psalm 119.9. How can a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed according to your word. With my whole heart I have sought you. Oh, let not me wander from your commandments. Your word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. So we can uh, use God's word. Uh, it worked pretty well for Jesus, didn't it, Matthew 4? Satan comes. Uh, Jesus is uh, fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. I would think that would make you just a little hungry. 
Uh, we'd say that he's going through a time of testing. Uh, Satan comes to him with the temptation. Uh, since you are, if and it is so, since you're the Son of God, turn these stones into bread. What does Jesus do? Uh, he quotes scripture. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Again, we call that the sword of the Spirit there in Ephesians 6. A very specific word for a very specific situation, uh, in this case, in a time of temptation. Your word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. Does that mean you need to uh, memorize some scripture? Yes, it does. That's exactly what that means. Well, I don't know if I can do that or not. I'm not a good memorizer. How are you going to get home today? I want to suggest you've already memorized the route. We memorize that constantly. It doesn't matter. It's just motivation. It's just repetition. Uh, and if you want to bear up under temptation, uh, hiding God's word in your heart is a very, very good way. If you struggle with it, write it on a card and put it in your top pocket. You know, by the time you read it, many times during the day, it'll kind of lock in itself. Uh, thirdly, the Holy Spirit is a resource. Galatians 5.16, I say then walk in the Spirit and you shall not fulfill uh, the lust of the flesh. This is the wonderful thing about the idea of walking in the Spirit. Hey, I just, you know, I give God control. Uh, I let him control me by his Spirit. Uh, and when I do that, uh, again, I won't, as Paul would say in other places, I just naturally don't gratify the sinful nature. Uh, I just, uh, I want to please the Lord and walk with the Lord. Uh, and, uh, and it's a wonderful thing. Does that mean that, that I, I won't ever be tempted? No, I'll be tempted. Uh, but I need to remember that I have the power of God's Spirit uh, with, within me. I'm not doing this alone. Uh, fourth, our, our spouse is a resource, as I mentioned in 1 Corinthians 7, in regard, regards to sexual sin. One thing's very clear in the New Testament, if you haven't figured it out, uh, one of the cures for sexual sin is to get married. <laughs> it's, uh, uh, it's very, very clear there what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 7. Uh, is that the only thing? No, but in, in that particular case, that's, uh, that's what's mentioned. Uh, and then fifthly, confession and repentance are both resources. First John 1 night, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just, will forgive us our sins and cleanse us uh, from all unrighteousness. Uh, in his present tense, it's an ongoing process. I like Proverbs 28, 13. He who covers his sin will not prosper, but whoever confesses and forsakes them will have mercy or find mercy. Confession and repentance is a wonderful thing. It's a, a natural part of the, uh, of the process. I see temptation. I begin to be allured. I begin to fall. Of course, Jesus said, if you even think it in your mind, you've actually already sinned, even before you act on it. So while it's in your mind, confess it. Renounce it. Uh, get right with God. Uh, go back to prayer, the Bible, reliance upon the Holy Spirit. Before it's acted, it, all be, it always begins between the ears, uh, doesn't it? Uh, that's the time where we can intercept it and recognize what's going on. Uh, that I am being deceived. This is actually a temptation. My circumstances really are not special. I hear that so often. Well, my situation is very unique. You know, my... My wife's just not a very nice person. And uh, you know, I don't know that she's really even a Christian. She says she's a Christian. Girl. I don't know that, you know. And, you know, the, the rationale goes, goes on, on and on and on. You know, oh, yes, I agree. You're so special, you idiot. You know, and then I give them some other godly counsel. Just you guys. It's, uh, it's such a deception. It's such a deception. Uh, <coughs> All temptation is common, Paul says, 1 Corinthians. It's, it's, I'm sorry, it's just all the same. You're not special. Uh, it's just all the same. It's going to come, lust of the mind, you know, pride of life, uh, lust of the flesh. It's going to fall in one of those categories. Uh, you're not special when it comes to being tempted. Uh, but at the same time, if you go back and look at that reference, uh, th there is a specialness to the lure uh, in which uh, Satan brings. And that part is different. Uh, he does watch. He kind of stalks us. Uh, again, Paul says in Ephesians 6. Uh, he'll figure out something uh, in terms of a weakness or our, our own desire. Uh, and uh, he'll come uh, at an opportune time. 
Uh, even in the Ephesians, uh, in the uh, Matthew 4 passage with Jesus, uh, after the three temptations, it says, and then Satan left. Never bothered him again. No, he left until a more opportune time. Uh, and uh, sometimes it comes in waves, uh, doesn't it? Uh, it seems like that because it really does. It really does. I mean, there's the ongoing, and we're kind of uh, uh, flooded uh, these days with uh, temptation and the uh, evil that's around us. It's just... Uh, uh, we, we don't live in a Christian nation uh, any, anymore. Most Christians, most people out there are not Christians anymore. Uh, and uh, uh, there, there's, there's a constant uh, evil that we, we deal with. Uh, but there are those waves where it's coming. We need to be able to, uh, to see it. Uh, we want to be able to stand up under it. Uh, we we want to be able to understand the, the circumstances. Oh, that looks interesting. I think I'll just ruin my life damage my children, my family, and, uh, uh, you know, and kind of trash whatever God might use my life for for the next uh, 30 or 40 years. Yeah, so I think I'll do all that because that looks interesting. Actually, that's what we should be doing. We should be considering the circumstances every time we see the, uh, the lure uh, coming, coming our way, whatever, whatever it might be. Again, because Jesus died because of the, save us from the penalty of sin, but the power of sin the power of sin over our lives. He saved us so he could transform us uh, and make us into who he wants us to be, which is actually a really wonderful thing, a really wonderful thing to be more, more like Christ. And uh, James, again, James doesn't uh, give us a lot of theology <laughs> like Paul. He just kind of, he just kind of whaps us upside the head, you know, and, uh, and it, uh, it doesn't, it doesn't let up for a while. I got to tell you, it goes all the way to the, to the end of chapter 5. It's just one subject after another, uh, rap, rapid fire. Uh, but James is trying to say, what is, it, what is a genuine Christian and what does a genuine Christian look like? You remember, he's writing to a group of people that are being persecuted. Most of them have lost everything, but they're still hanging in there. They're out preaching the gospel. They live in a culture that is against them, that maligns them on, on a regular basis. Uh, and we said that uh, there's a lot of ways that we should be able to relate to what this letter is saying, what it's saying to us. Amen? Well, let's pray. Lord, we do uh, thank you for the resources that we have uh, in Jesus Christ, for the Holy Spirit, for your word, for prayer, uh, for confession. Lord, uh, for friends that can stand with us and pray for us. Uh, Lord, when we're facing, especially if it's a habitual kind of temptation that, uh, that comes our way, uh, then we really do need uh, the reinforcements uh, in terms of people praying for us and with us. Lord, just give us wisdom. Again, in the midst of a trial, you said, hey, ask for wisdom, I'll give it to you. Help us to have the wisdom to realize that when we're uh, in a time of testing, like Abraham, in a time of drought, we still can really trust you. We don't have to look to Egypt, to the world, and have the allurement to go there instead of staying and trusting you. Lord, so we pray that you give us all wisdom, that we would live a life that would give glory to you and be a blessing to those uh, around us. Help us to have ears to hear what you'd have to say to us this morning. But there's something that uh, we need to repent from Right now, I pray that we would. There's something that we need to consider the consequences of right now. I pray that we would. And we would turn and we would get back to that place of safety uh, in Jesus Christ and get our hearts right before you. And there's the opportunity for each of us to do that as we share in communion this morning. Lord, we don't want to do this in a time when we're not enduring. We're not bearing up under temptation. We're kind of falling into it. This would be that time to kind of re recalibrate, uh, rethink things through, uh, and confess our sins, knowing that you're just, uh, and you will forgive. You will purify us from all unrighteousness. And we, I would just pray that... Uh, each of us, Lord, that need to do that, would do that now in our own hearts and minds. So that now, then, we truly can take communion and truly commune with you. Not just go through a little ritual because we do it, 
that we would remember what these elements are and they would be used to draw us closer to you and remember the price that was paid for our sins so that not just the penalty, but the power of sin could be broken over our lives. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.